We're one of those organizations that has gaily quoted uh, the ultimatum game as demonstration of the bankruptcy of homo economists. Uh, um, but uh, your book sends that ball right back over the net. So tell us about that. Yeah. So it's funny that you, when, when you said, Matthew, that you wanted to look at two of the controversial topics, we were, we were, we were almost laughing when you said altruism because not a single, as we've gone around, the United States and in the UK, not anyone has ever called that controversial. So it's interesting that it's... Well, first of all, no one's ever heard of the ultimatum game except for yeah, this room. It. You see, so, we, we, we were an audience. You could choose between talking about prostitution or altruism, but this is an audience that is just so much more interested in goodness. Well, it's so much more interested in goodness than sex. Yeah. That's the RSA audience. Uh, so, um, so let me... So let me... Uh, uh, Dumber with this fun part. Let me do the background of uh, uh, the history. So within economics, there has been a long tradition of viewing uh, human behavior as being primarily motivated by, motivated, not exclusively, but primarily motivated by self-interest. And uh, I would say that uh, in the 70s, a set of renegades, uh, renegades who I think are quite popular uh, uh, among this crowd, uh, began challenging those ideas and, and trying to, well, let me say test, test those ideas. Uh, and it's very difficult to test for altruism in the real world, because uh, when, uh, I don't know if this is just an American example, I guess it was true in England as well, when barns used to burn down, uh, everyone would gather from the whole community to help build the barn again. And this certainly has a feel of altruism to it, uh, and yet, uh, if you didn't help your neighbors build their barn, they wouldn't help you if your barn got built. Okay, so it's, very, it's much more complex than the idea that you simply want to help others. Uh, tied to it is an idea of reputation uh, and, um, and insurance that goes with it. Uh, so these economists had the idea that they should go into the lab uh, and use college students to, to test these ideas. And this had been quite popular among psychologists, but almost unheard of among economists. There were just a handful of lab experiments in economics uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. Um, but eventually, what uh, economists uh, came to do was to try to test using games like the ultimatum game, the dictator game. And what they found over and over was that college students behaved as if they were incredibly giving and altruistic in the lab, that the, um, what, what economists have come to call social preferences were quite prevalent. Do you want to explain the ultimatum game, just in case there's people? Yeah, so, okay, so you take over. You can take over. And, All right, and so, some, well, where Levitt was about to get yeah. to, you know, we could fast forward a little bit and talk about the work of a, a colleague of Levitt's named John List. And that's really what, what the chapter is about is, um, just as an aside, when we write these books, what we try to do is um, not have them just be screeds or dogma, recitations of dogma, but have them be stories that revolve around a, a person, a character, in some way. And maybe the driest character um, eligible for inclusion in a book like this is another academic research economist, like John List, um, but that's who we chose for, for this uh, bit on altruism. And so he's a, a colleague of Levitt's at the University of Chicago, and Levitt actually began to do a lot of this work with him. And it revolved around trying to take the received wisdom about altruism that was derived from 20, 30 years worth of, you know, first lab work, but then extended, as it sounds like many of you know, extended well out into the lab. So these projects that took the ultimatum and dictator game out into societies all over the world to try to measure generosity among people, to try to establish essentially what is the baseline level of human altruism, essentially, to be very reductive about it. So John List, was an experimental economist, is an experimental economist, who liked lab experiments like a lot of economists, but he also um, liked doing experiments in the real world where people didn't know that they were being observed. And so he had kind of absorbed a sort of dissonance between the received wisdom that the lab seemed to teach and the way the real world could actually work and wanted to really you know, further identify or ultimately identify just the level uh, and the kind of robustness of the altruism that you see in the lab. So what John List did was he did exactly what everyone before him had done, which is run the same experiments. So let's, let's just do the dictator game. So ultimatum game is where, let's say, I would offer you, let's, let's say two of us, let's pretend the two of us would come into a lab and let's say you're the experimenter. And we would not see each other. We'd be anonymous to each other. In the ultimatum game, let's say I would be given $10. 
and I would be told that there's someone else like me in another room that I won't see who um, doesn't get any money of his, his or her own, and I can choose to give some amount of my $10 to that other person. If that person accepts my offer, then I go, he, he goes home with the offer, and I go home with the rest of the money. So if I have $10, I say, I'll give that person $4. And he says, OK, I'll take 4 even though I know the other person's getting a bit more. Then we both go home relatively happy. He has $4, and I have $6. Okay? And if I were uh, the person in charge of the giving, I would say, two cents for you. Yeah. And, and you would say? And I would say, because I'm human, because I'm not an economist. Just so, for the record, Levitt's an economist. I'm just a lowly journalist. Because I'm a lowly journalist, I don't think like an economist does. And I would actually be upset. So an economist, who is emotionless, essentially, would, would choose, <laughs> would say to him or herself, oh, well, two cents is more than zero. And therefore, I should take the two cents. And why do I need to surrender my two cents to punish the so other person? Did you make it clear? So if, if the person rejects, yeah. but I wouldn't pay to me. If the yeah. person rejects, everyone walks out with zero. Right. If I, offer ten, if I offer four and he rejects it, I get zero. So if he and offers I, two cents to me, right, both we both zero. get zero. So if he offers two cents to me and I reject his two cent offer, he does not get $9.98. He gets zero. It's called the ultimatum game because you have to find the ultimatum at which both people can accept it. Now, that's kind of the more fun, more slightly more complicated game. The simpler game that John List chose to pursue was, is called Dictator. And Dictator derives from ultimatum, but it's even simpler, and it's just one direction. There's no ability to rebuff the offer. And the way Dictator works is this, uh, many iterations, but essentially this. We come into a room. Uh, we don't see each other. I'm given $10 and told that I can give some of my some or all of my amount, from zero to $10, to this other person like me in another room whom I will never see. So it's entirely anonymous. Uh, I won't see him after. And um, I don't know what that person might use the money for. It's not like you know, the charity. It's not like the barn building ex experience that Levitt described a minute ago. So let's pretend for, for a minute that we're the professors running this experiment, and you all are the students who come in. You are the dictator. You're the one, only one who makes a decision. This person has no say in the matter. He only gets to keep what you say he gets to keep. So you're given $10, single dollar bills in an envelope, let's say. There's another person in another room. Let's see by show of hands. Raise your hand if you would give all 10 of your dollars to the person down the hall in the other room. Go ahead and, OK. So there's always one or two Gandhis in the room. Who, <laughs> and, and the world needs a, a few. Um, now, ra raise your hand if you would give, let's say, $5. Five or ten. So that's like, a, goodness gracious, maybe 40% here? Wow. Uh, raise your hand if you'd give, let's say, one, two, three, or four dollars. Okay. Now raise your, raise, okay, Matthew's a, and raise your hand if you'd give zero. Yeah. So Levitt, do do, what do you think about the zeros? So the best predictor of people giving zero, it turns out, is being undergraduate economics major. So how, <laughs> <laughs> we got one right here. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. So you, you've learned your studies well. Okay. Yeah. So you get an A for today's <laughs> lesson. So when John List ran these experiments, he found pretty much like all who'd come before him that people gave on average about three dollars, right? Yeah, three, three out of ten. Yep. Three out of their ten dollars, which which seems to, now again this is an incredibly simplistic reduction of what altruism is about, but it seems to show that in the lab, people, when given an opportunity to give some of what they have been given or some of what they have to someone else who will never see them, who can't thank them even later, that they give some of what they have. Now, John List thought, well, that's really interesting. Wait, and but let's just stop for a second. Just, I want to say, so hundreds of experiments have done done this, and the economists and the psychologists involved have taken that as evidence against the standard economic model. What they say is, look, people don't be, they don't behave in their self-interest. They're eager to give away their money to strangers, even though there's no benefit. Therefore, we need to remake our economic models. A lot of what we write about are how incentives affect behavior, right? And a lot of what we write about are how often very simple tweaks to incentives will affect behavior quite a bit, uh, often in ways that are not expected. So what John List did now, having some more real world experience perhaps than a lot of the other experimental economists, decided to change the parameters, change the frame of the experiment a little bit. You come in, we give you $10, but instead of having the option to go from giving away from 10 to 0 of your dollars, you can go from 10 to negative 1, which is another way of saying you can take $1 from the person in the other room who will still not see you. So you can walk out now with, let's say, $11, OK? So think about how you might play the game now. Um, I would invite um, the, the very, very benevolent soul who gave $10 before to ask, would you still give all $10 if you now have the option to take one as well? 
You would. All right. So you're just an outlier who will never be explained by science. <laughs> and thank God. I mean, you know, these people are very valuable to society. Uh, as you can see, however, they're quite rare. But here's what John List found. Once you change it from 10, once you give people the option to go from negative one, suddenly, in real life, nobody's giving $10 anymore. Nobody, practically nobody's giving $5 anymore. The most common choice now made is zero, correct? Right? So you want to take over? You want to start talking for a bit? No. You look uh, ready to, no? You okay? No, All right. So, um, so now you see, you go from, now the average, the average giving is still positive at this point, right? It's about a dollar and a half or so, right? But what you've seen is you've just given people one choice. So what it appears to be is that instead of exhibiting just pure altruism, what it may appear to be is that people in an experimental setting kind of have an expectation of wanting to appear like the kind of person who is nice enough to give people some money, as opposed to actually wanting to give the money. And instead of seeming, so you want to you give $3 on average because you want to look like a good person. Now you can look like a good person simply by not stealing from the other person, OK? Simply by giving zero. But now, John, this goes even further. What if I push it to $10? What if I can take $10 from the other person? I can give up to 10, and I can take up to 10. When you run the experiment like that, you find that on average now, instead of giving, on average, people steal. They steal about a dollar and a half, as opposed to giving away $3. So what you've seen is just by changing the frame, and just by making the experiment a little bit more like the real world, where you can give and take. My favorite exhibit of this is the church collection plate. When it comes down the pew, right, we give, we give, we give, but the opportunity is there to take. And you'll notice when everybody, whenever anybody has a large bill, because they don't have change, and, and they have to make change, they always, in a very audible whisper, have to say, just making change, because it, it, it can't, it's not proud to be seen taking any money out, even though you're just making change for your hundred or whatnot. So in, a, in, in just a few tweaks of the experiment, John Liss was able to show that these altruists, who were giving 30% of what they had, were actually a gang of thieves when given the opportunity. It's not that the people had changed, it's just that the people were responding to the incentives and the particular parameters of the, of the experiment. And that is how we, in a nutshell, try to reassess what we've learned from e economic experiments about altruism. Yeah. I, mean, I think in some sense, there's been a willful blindness among uh, academic economists in this research. And all of you, I'm sure, take the tube from time to time. Well, raise your hand if you've ever had a stranger come up to you on the tube and say, I have $10, I'm about to get off, let me just give you three and I'll, I'll never see you again. I mean, so how can you willfully blind yourself and say that people are incredibly altruistic based on lag appearance when we have literally hundreds of millions of data points which suggest that people are just not that altruistic uh, in everyday life of, of being on the subway. And so I, I think the primary thing you learn from these studies is that you can get college students to do absolutely anything you want by putting them in the lab, putting them under a high degree of scrutiny, and with subtle or not so subtle cues, enticing them to behave in a way that uh, you want them to behave. And I think ultimately the right model to think of these experiments is exactly as Stephen said, that people care somewhat about their own um, personal uh, financial wealth, and they care about how other people perceive them. And so when someone like me stands over them in a white lab coat and, and, and looks over them, I think that what goes through their mind is, What's the least amount of money I can give away and not look like a jerk in front, of the, uh, in front of the professor? And that changes depending on the parameters of the game. And what, what's most interesting is that uh, uh, the single most popular answer in the game where you can either give away 10 or steal up to 10 is to steal the entire $10. Okay? And so what you find is that for those people, they still don't want to look like a jerk, but they can walk out of there with their initial $10, uh, that they get for showing up. The $10 they're given as part of this game and $10 from the other guy. And you realize that for 30 bucks, you don't mind looking like a jerk <laughs> in front of the professor. You kind of are able to price out exactly how much it's worth to appear to not look like a, a, you know, a, 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 you know, someone who's, who's not civil. Um, I think we know, should also say this doesn't mean we discount real altruism in the real world. Right. The two questions I want to ask. The first is a, a, a kind of tiny question, which is how do you therefore explain what happened in Stanley Milgram's experiments, and how do you explain what happened in Philip Zimbardo's experiments, when as I understand that college students behaved in an appallingly sadistic manner? Oh, no, I think, I, I think if you put people in, so let me, let me say two things, okay, I won't come to that, but as, as Dominic said, look, this is not about, these, what, what I think the, the bottom line of, of, these, of, of what John List has shown, and this in other settings, is, is not about whether people are inherently altruistic or not. 
It's saying that what these lab experiments just don't tell us about that. They tell us about something completely different. They tell us about how people respond to context. And, and I think that, uh, you know, the, like Danny Kahneman, who I've talked about with this, agrees completely. I mean, that, that, that this, what you've learned from these experiments is that, is that uh, the behavior is a function of context and, and you, you can't think of it. And I think that's exactly what happens, that, that there's a, a tremendous social pressure in, in the Milgram experiments to press, to turn that dial higher and higher, and to shock people hot more and more, and you feel, you know, you know it's the same with where, where you go around the room and, and everyone says, like, two plus two equals five, and everyone else says five, and for a while you say two plus two equals four, and eventually you give up, and it's because there's such tremendous social pressure not to look different. And so I think what we learn is that social pressure and scrutiny are incredibly important for influencing behavior. I think policy input, we could argue a little bit more strongly. And you know, one argument that we make in the book that I think we both feel very strongly about is, what, you know, what's the downside of assuming that there's less altruism in the world than the lab experiments exp tell us? And I think the downside is we come to rely on altruism too much societally for problems that will not be solved by altruism. And the single best example, I think, that we write about is organ donation. Right? So in, in the States, the medical miracle came along that someone could live by accepting a door, uh, an organ, particularly a kidney, from a living donor, okay? Uh, one of the few organs you can easily give up and live because we have two and you really only need one. The out, now, now, I won't say that uh, the U.S. government, when it was making its organ donation policy, uh, looked at these lab experiments, but the same conclusion was felt, which is that people are innately altruistic and therefore we can rely on the societal altruism to produce a public good like people stepping forward to donate organs. As a matter of fact, it's been a huge failure. The fact is, is that the organ waiting list, the kidney waiting list in the US gets longer every year. More people die every year who are on the list. More people choose every year to not even bother to try to get on the list because they know that the available supply of donated organs is so low. If altruism ran wild through our veins, so yes, you could say, well, there's a big difference between giving three out of your $10 and, and being willing to give up a kidney. Right? But if altruism ran wild through our veins, or fairness, or cooperation, or whatever it is that we think had been identified, then you would think that at least 40,000 people out of 3 million people would step forward every year to give one kidney, because they live and it's not that big a deal. And yet it doesn't happen. But by basing a policy on the assumption of an altruism, then you make what turns out to be a, a, a mistake that literally takes lives every year. By putting a price on a transaction, you take away some of the um, so it's kind of the moral suasion argument, right? So the example we used was daycare in Israel. So it turns out that if parents drop kids off late at daycare, um, pick them up late. Pick them, pick them up late. Yeah, they, they love it if you drop them off late. <laughs> they still want you to pick them up late. So if you pick them up late, and then so it used to be they just frowned at you, okay? And then and then they basically started paying, charging very small amounts of money, like a dollar, if you if you were late to pick up your kid, and what the response of parents was, well, geez, if it's only worth a dollar to the people at the daycare, I'm going to go enjoy my coffee, take my time, I'll get there late, okay? And then it turned out even after they took away the fine, people continued to come, uh, to come late to pick up. So I think it's partly about the price you choose. If you choose a price too low, you signal that it's not very valuable. If you choose a price too high, you can obviously induce um, people who are not well qualified, and then I think it becomes a technology solution to try and get it. But, but let, me, let me go back to your point about social construction of altruism, because I think that's absolutely right. That what these studies, the bottom line of these studies tell us is that these studies are not per se about altruism, they're about the importance of context. And so from that perspective, it is clear that the context in which you embed people uh, will affect the degree to which they are altruistic, right? In small communities, by virtue of, and, and I think we also want to make clear, it doesn't matter what your motives are. What we care about are outcomes, right? So in a small community where reputation can, can function well, who cares whether the guy hammers in the nails on the barn because he loves his neighbor or because he's afraid his barn is going to burn down? It doesn't matter that much. Uh, it's the behavior, it's, it's the, it's the like, social insurance that's provided that I think is more important than motivation.